The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Syndica Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, lots of talk over the past couple of weeks about technology in Africa, specifically in Ethiopia, where two, maybe two and a half weeks ago, they just concluded an auction for one of two telecom licenses. And this in many ways was seen as a proxy between the United States and China, in part because behind the two bids for those telecom licenses were very strong forces from the United States and from China. So let me just quickly break this down because it's going to get to the point that we're going to talk about today. Ethiopia put up two telecom licenses minus not including the mobile money service. We're going to get to mobile money very quickly here. But these telecom licenses are highly valued in part because this is one of the last virgin markets in Africa. And a lot of big telecom operators who are seeing saturation growth in their own markets saw this as a big opportunity. So the winning bid went to a consortium led by Safaricom from Kenya. That's the main telecom operator in Kenya, and Sumitomo Corporation from Japan. Together, they led a consortium that had $500 million of financing from the Development Finance Corporation of the United States. So that's the U.S. side of it. They won that bid with $850 million. On the other side, the loser for that bid was a, a, a consortium led by MTN, and that's close to you in South Africa. They're one of the main telecom operators there, and they had financing back from the Silk Road Fund of China. Now, one of the stipulations in the DFC's winning bid was that there will be no use of any Chinese technology in the new telecom network, either Huawei or ZTE. That's what makes this so interesting. However, since that bid went through, and there was a lot of celebration on Twitter among U.S. stakeholders saying, suck it, Huawei, we beat you in this one. Finally, we got a win in Africa. Well, well, hold on. Because in the time since that bid, the Biden administration has now implemented sanctions against the Ethiopian government for the war in Tigray. And as part of those sanctions, the DFC financing may be impacted by that. So if the Safaricom Sumitomo bid cannot raise the other $500 million from another source, if they are not able to tap that money from the United States, they may have to throw the bid back open again giving the China Silk Road Fund and MTN another shot at it. Also, the CEO of MTN announced this week that he is going to gun for another try at the telecom license. So just because on the first license, the Chinese were not successful in getting Huawei or ZTE equipment, that doesn't mean it may not happen. Now, I mentioned that mobile money was not part of these bids, in part because Ethiopia Telecom, they kept that aside and it's very interesting because Huawei Mobile Money announced a deal with Ethiopia Telecom to create a service called Teleber using Huawei Mobile Money. Huawei Mobile Money is one of these platforms in Africa that people don't really know a lot about. It's now operational in at least six countries, including obviously Ethiopia and more importantly, M-Pesa in Kenya. This is the popular mobile money service in Kenya that runs on a Huawei Mobile Money platform. Altogether, it's deployed in 19 countries, serving more than 152 million users. In fact, 22% of all registered mobile money accounts throughout the entire developing world use Huawei mobile money. And that goes to one of the points here is that maybe one of the trends that we're going to see in the next few years is Huawei shifting away from hardware and into software in part because we're seeing a really sharp degradation of their market share in Huawei. Uh, let's quickly go through some of the smartphone shipments from 2020. Now, this is according to CounterPoint Research. Techno, which is part of the Transin family of brands. Transin is the largest phone company that most people have never heard of. It is a Shenzhen-based company, but it is the dominant phone maker in Africa. Their Techno brand 
uh, now has 18% of total smartphone shipments to Africa last year, for the first time beating out market leader Samsung, who had 15%. Another techno brand, Itel, placed third with 12%, and then Huawei came in fourth with 8%. That Huawei market share continues to fall as Huawei is now divesting from the handphone and smartphone business more and more. It sold its Honor brand, and it's just having a real difficult time. And the reason why Cobus is having such a difficult time is because of the United States sanctions that were imposed last year by the Trump administration when they added Huawei to the entities list. And by being on the entities list, they could no longer access certain American technologies, namely the Android operating system. So lots of difficulties for Huawei in certain parts of their business, but I think that a lot of Americans may be getting a little bit ahead of themselves and thinking that Huawei is suffering in Africa when in fact there's all these other underlying services beyond 5G and beyond handsets that people just don't see. That's, I think, completely true. At the same time, this issue of of which operating system African users are gonna are gonna be using on their Chinese phones is a really massive one. It's one that 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 goes beyond the, the specific kind of market share that Huawei has in Africa, which is already a big issue. But it, it it then encompasses all of these other Chinese brands and raises a lot of questions about about the kind of consumer choices. You know, particularly going going, going forward, like which kind of options are going to be open for for African consumers, which could really change the the kind of calculus for Chinese phone makers on the continent, I think. Well, let's get a perspective on this from Washington, from somebody who has been studying this issue for not just the past year, but for many, many years. Henry Tugendat is a senior policy analyst with the China team at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he focuses on issues related to Chinese engagement in both Africa and Latin America. He's been in this space for a very, very long time. And recently penned a column for the Washington Post's Monkey Cage column entitled Huawei is trying to avoid U.S. sanctions that may change the U.S.-China tech rivalry in Africa. A very good morning to you, Henry. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with the big picture of where Huawei is today from your vantage point. It's interesting because you sit in Washington very close to the main point of opposition against Huawei and their engagement in places like Africa, but at the same time, you do see the big picture in Africa in terms of all the different businesses that Huawei is in on the continent. Give us your take on where we are today, broadly speaking, about Huawei in Africa. Sure. I mean, I think the debate over Huawei really depends on what type of technology that that it is that you're focused on. So, for example, um, Huawei focuses on, as you mentioned, handsets, but it also focuses on carrier equipment and enterprise equipment. Uh, And by enterprise equipment, I'm talking about the networks uh, that companies or big institutions like governments or universities will set up, uh, and that will have cloud computing and, you know, intranet services and internal email systems and security software within that. In that front, uh, it's not really mentioned very often, but Cisco an American company is really still very much the dominant company, not just in advanced economic markets like Europe and the US, but also across Africa. For instance, you know, in, in, in most African universities uh, that teach telecommunications courses or electrical engineering so- courses, it is still the case that Cisco accreditation is mandatory for completing uh, a course in certain universities, whereas Huawei's very similar programs are considered an elective or a choice. And these are actually things that Huawei subsidizes. And it's trying to get more people accredited in its, in its software because the, the more people that are accredited in Huawei or Cisco, the more sales those companies will make in terms of the actual hardware and the software that they're trying to pitch. Um, but then coming back to the carrier equipment, how does it look? Well. The, the reality is that that is where Huawei seems to be catching up very quickly with its competitors, such as Nokia and Ericsson. This is more in the 2G, 3G, 4G sectors for now. I think there is a lot of attention being focused on the significance of 5G. And I am certainly sympathetic to the view that 5G will be significant as and when it comes. And the debates that we're having now matter because they create 
you know, if you if you install 3G and 4G equipment from one company, then it's cheaper to then continue in that path dependency with the same hardware manufacturer. That's the whole debate that's going on in Europe at the moment with Vodafone protesting the need to rip out its Huawei infrastructure because it's it's going to cost it more now to, to replace it with Ericsson and Nokia equipment. So to come back to the African context, Huawei is very successful in some markets with some operators. But I think what we're really lacking at the moment is dependable data on where and how much. So in my PhD research, this was something that I tried to understand within uh, the context of Kenya and Nigeria. And a lot of people will focus first on talking to the equipment manufacturers themselves as if they have the answers. But of course, the equipment manufacturers are all going to tell you that they are better than the next person. And so the only real way to get a handle on what is actually happening is to talk to the operators, the customers, the the universities, the government departments, whoever it is that's buying this equipment, and find out from them the level of saturation that they have from each company. And so to give you an example, there's a there's a statistic that's been going around from news report to news report that 70% of Africa's 4G is built by Huawei. Now, I have absolutely no idea where that statistic comes from. I, I've been trying to trace it. It's possible that it could come from one of the the expensive companies like Deloro that gather data on the telecommunications sector in various markets. But until somebody cites them, I, I have no idea where that statistic comes from. And I, I, I wonder if it's just somebody made a guess and it seemed like a plausible one and it get, kept on getting repeated. But the reality is that Huawei's uh, market saturation really depends on the operator. And so in some cases, you will get a scenario where they may supply 90, uh, 90% uh, of an operator's hardware. I, I saw that in Nigeria and it was a real one-off and it was an insane business decision because, of course, if you are oversaturated with one company's hardware, then that company can then charge you a premium for any upgrades thereafter. Yeah, let me just give the origin of that 70% number that you've cited, because it is often cited. It dates back to a 2019 article in Foreign Policy magazine by Amy McKinnon, who's the national security and intelligence reporter there. And she, in the second paragraph of her article, said that Huawei has built 70% of Africa's 4G networks and never attributed that. And everybody has gone back to that foreign policy article, me included as well, irresponsibly, because there is no attribution as to how she came up with that number. So but it is something that has taken on a life of its own now as a truism. And it kind of plays into Huawei's favor. So they probably haven't discouraged it, even if it's not true, because it's an enormous number. But Kobus, this is an issue you and I have talked about, that Huawei, regardless if it's 70 percent, has certainly been a dominant player in establishing and building Africa's 4G networks. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's, it's not only the, the fact that Huawei built a bunch of the networks themselves, it's that they that they operate at, at every level of, of the internet provision process, everything from, from undersea cables, you know, to now diminishing numbers of handsets, but also that they work with, with all of these, these established African telecom companies, you know, like, like, like big ones in South Africa, like MTN. Um, Henry, I, you know, I remember from last year, um, you know, when uh, before the before the the leadership transition in the U.S., when there was when the Trump administration was putting a lot of a lot of pressure on Huawei. Um, and it was announced that you know that it's going to become harder for Huawei to, to access kind of Google products and and you know and to work on for enhances to work on Google operating systems, um, and then at the same time that that Huawei is is developing its own Harmony operating system, um, and then you know kind of as that kind of pressure tapered off a little bit, it, it kind of went silent in the in the mainstream press. So I was wondering where the Harmony operating system is standing now, and you know kind of and to which extent is it is it being rolled out to, to, uh, to consumers? It was originally set to release in April of this year. The gossip websites on Huawei releases are similar to the gossip websites on any tech releases, you know. There are plenty of Apple gossip websites that tell you when the new MacBook or whatever is going to be coming out. And they're often shooting in the dark. And so similarly with um, Harmony OS, it was due to release in April of this year, according to a Huawei statement. But then that got pushed back and now the gossip websites are taking over and they most recently predicted that it will come out in June of this year. Uh, I should clarify that the beta version of Harmony OS did come out at the end of March as expected, but really what we're waiting on is the 
um, release of the, ha- the, the Huawei Mate handsets uh, that are pre-installed with Harmony OS uh, on it. That would be the, f- the first significant step because then we'll start to get a sense of the functionality of Harmony OS. And that matters because you need developers and you need customers to make uh, uh, a mobile phone's operating system successful. And, and Windows OS is the perfect example of, of one that had a lot of money and a lot of backing, but it just never got the developers and it never got the customers to succeed. And so Harmony OS is a, is a real game changer in, this, in so far as this will be the first operating system that is not Apple or Android for the first time in several years. And given that it is built by Huawei, and uh, I'm sure we'll have support from institutions like the China Development Bank that are built to support Chinese innovation like this, I think this is more than just a tech foray. Uh, This is more than just market competition. You know, I think this has larger political overtones in that the Chinese government will quite understandably want to see this succeed, Uh, not just because it is all about supporting Chinese innovation and and a, a new business venture by Huawei. But if you think about the security implications, I think the first thing that the Chinese government may be thinking is that this is really an opportunity to divest themselves of... Western operating systems, Uh, you know, currently, it's not just Africa that predominantly uses Android and Apple, as is the rest of the world, it's China as well. And so this is really an opportunity for um, Chinese government to support the innovation of an operating system that will necessarily have security implications insofar as the Chinese government will want to support its rollout across other Chinese handset manufacturers in China, if only to mean that they are no longer dependent on, for example, US GPS satellite systems. You know, I I presume that this Harmony OS will have more apps that depend on China's Beidou satellite system. Or this is also an opportunity to make sure that, you know, emails or texts or whatever it is that may be accessible through Android and OS operating systems that have their servers in the US will now no longer depend on that. And so what I see is a very obvious opportunity for the Chinese state to want to support the success of Harmony OS within China. But what's interesting about this is I I don't think either side, the, the, the US or China, ever foresaw the greater implications of the Android bans when they first took place uh, in 2019, as part of, of course, the, the broader Huawei bands, which is that given the saturation of Chinese handsets in uh, developing markets, the implications of a Chinese-built software for third-party handset manufacturers from China in the rest of the world is large. You know, even if Harm, even if Huawei's handsets market is declining, which it is, and it is presumed to continue to decline, Harmony OS is significant because it is designed to be used by third-party handset manufacturers like Transion, like um, uh, Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, all of the others. And I, I don't think it's crazy to say that in a few months' time, if Harmony OS is a success, if it gets the developers and it gets the customers, and I... I think there's more reason to believe that it will succeed where Windows failed because of the slightly larger political overtones involved. I don't know. I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you only because tech history is littered with mobile operating systems that have failed. And this is a world now that is ruled by iOS and by Android. I remember I had a Palm, you know, and Palm OS was supposed to be the big thing. I still remember when I had a Nokia and Symbian OS was supposed to be the big thing. Then came along Windows, as you talked about, that was supposed to be the big thing. But really where we are today is in a bifurcated world between Android and uh, and Apple. And remember, Transcend and Huawei don't get along with one another. There is no camaraderie among the Chinese tech brands when it comes to this. They're fierce competitors. They sue each other constantly. Uh, and, and so I'm not so sure there's any national unity here that because China has geopolitical ambitions to decouple from the United States on tech, that Transcend or 
Oppo or Vivo are immediately going to line up behind that objective when they know full well that in order for a mobile OS to be successful, it needs apps and it needs apps that run beautifully on it. And I am skeptical that Google is going to spend millions of dollars to build apps for Harmony OS simply because A, it doesn't look good, but B, the, the numbers aren't there. The audience just isn't going to be there. And it'll take years for, the, for them to do that. And imagine how much money Google invests in R&D alone. So even though the Chinese state is really active behind this, they may not be able to keep up with the likes of Apple and Google, who are trillion dollar companies and are putting massive amounts of resources into their OSs. Even China, even Huawei may not be able to keep up with those two. Absolutely. And on that point, obviously, this is this is why I would bring in the China Development Bank. You know, it, it has the firepower that those bigger companies in, in the West have to, to drive that sort of innovation. And I, I do think that that's going to be significant. I also totally take your point about the animosity between the Chinese tech brands. In fact, the only no news report that I found so far within Chinese media about uh, the possibility of adoption of Harmony OS had a quote from uh, ZTE, who obviously famously hate uh, Harmony. And they released a public statement in, I think it was February or March, just to say, no, thank you, we will not be, uh, we're not looking to adopt Harmony OS. I do not think that companies like Oppo, Vivo, all of these handset manufacturers are waited, waiting with bated breath to support this nationalist project. Uh, absolutely not. My, my point is more that they will continue to use Android for as long uh, as they can, for as long as it's a more successful brand. I don't know that Harmony OS will be very successful at the outset. But it's more that if it reaches a stage where it's good enough, I think it is conceivable that the Chinese government, given the state of US-China relations today, that the Chinese government may say, well, look, you put a, bla you put a ban on Huawei using Android, uh, we're going to put a ban on our handset manufacturers using Android too. And then the last point about that is just that uh, you mentioned that Google would it be investing to develop apps for Harmony OS? Well, it can't. I mean, they actually applied to be able to use Google again last year, I think. And the, this was banned by the legislation in place from 2019 from the US. But I think there is also a provision that says that Facebook will not be allowed on, these, on this platform either. Okay, so right there, it's dead on arrival in Africa. No Facebook, no Google, no YouTube. I mean, no maps. Forget it. It's dead. There's this is, you know, it's never going to go anywhere. It's also, I mean, sure, that, that's true. But at the same time, no, no cheap phones other than Chinese phones in Africa. Right. So like, so, so Henry, like, I, like, in, from, from, like judging from experience in, in, in researching this. No, in but Nokia is there. Samsung's there. So there are other alternatives in terms of price points that aren't just Chinese okay, well, phones. You know, kind of, but in, 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 in terms of, in terms of your, your kind of like work in Africa, um, where, where do you think? this kind of inflection point lies like you do you think do you think like well, what would be easier for for african consumers to kind of switch their operating system and keep their phones or to have to completely buy new phones and and you know eric i take that i, I take your point that you know that that nokia and, and and samsung and so on are, are present but but in terms of you know if, if you walk into a phone store you know kind of i, I think you know it's, it's in johannesburg but also particularly outside of south africa then you know, a very a very significant number of your your kind of like affordable options are going to be Chinese. Um, so, so do you think you know, like how, how do you think the sifting will happen? Do you think that you know, kind of that 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 people will be more more willing to change their phones or to change their operating systems? You've teed it up perfectly to say that I, I do think that uh, the the price will win out. You know, I, I totally get that Nokia and Samsung are there, but they're not there for a hundred dollars a smartphone in the same way that Techno phones are. Um, they're a bit more expensive. And I, I think that that's the market that Chinese handset manufacturers have cornered. You know, I mean, Huawei handsets, sure, they're competing with Samsung and Nokia at a higher price point. But I, I what I foresee in this is uh, that this is an operating system that can operate on uh, cheaper Chinese handsets. And if there is a point in which they adopt those because they jump or because they're pushed uh, for domestic political reasons, then that is a scenario in which African consumers will be faced with the choice of, OK, well, you know, how much am I willing to pay to keep WhatsApp? And I, I totally get that WhatsApp is, has a cultural and political force in Africa like no other region in the world. However, I'm not sure that 
people will pay the premium of a five hundred dollar Samsung phone if they can get a hundred dollar Techno phone. And no, I mean Samsung does produce those those lower price phones, and they're comp- they're not as competitive as the Chinese are today. But I think if Samsung saw that China was on the ropes in Africa, they would push down the price of mark of the phones. Just the same way here in Southeast Asia, comparable market in many ways to Africa in terms of price points and per capita income. Uh, Samsung is very competitive here. The Chinese phones definitely dominate the same way. But I don't believe for a second that people are going to give up Facebook, their social media, WhatsApp, YouTube, and they're going to be some relegated to some kind of second-class citizenship in terms of, of accessing these digital tools that the rest of the world combines. Let's not forget that the median age in Africa is 19.7 years old. These are teenagers who have been raised on Facebook and WhatsApp and these, and these platforms. They're not going to give that up under any circumstances. Somebody's going to come in and, and, and give that to them. I just don't believe in, in – and I don't think there's any precedent for people, particularly young people, to say, yeah, I don't need WhatsApp anymore. I can do without it. <laughs> I've never seen that happen at all. I'd be very skeptical. Well, you know, kind of this – you know, I have two words for you, TikTok. Yes. Yeah, um, but TikTok is you know, one app, though. It's like it's not so difficult. It's not so difficult to get young people off Facebook now. Maybe Facebook, but certainly WhatsApp is a different story. YouTube is a different story. I mean, those are, I mean, getting people off of, of those and, the, and also just being with the global trends. I don't think they want to be on the outside looking in as to all the things happening in Asia, in Latin America, and in all the other parts of the world. And Africa has got this cheap ass Harmony OS that doesn't have as many apps. I, I'm just skeptical that they, they would tolerate that. Henry, what do you what do you think? It's also it doesn't necessarily need to be so binary as WhatsApp versus WeChat, although those are obviously the the most obvious candidates. We don't know what Harmony OS will look like on third party handsets. You know, a lot of this article is a thought piece, basically. You know, of th- these are a series of events that would that are interesting to think through. Yeah, and you've provoked a great conversation. So that you mission accomplished right there, no doubt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, you know, there are third party uh, messaging apps that are huge in other parts of the world as in Southeast Asia, as you point out, like Line. Well, we have one here called Zalo. We have a lot of alternative apps that are competitors to the big ones. But at the end of the day, people also want to have access to the big ones. So, for example, here in Vietnam, Zalo is a major, it's like a super app. We also have Grab. These are these super apps that compete with the likes of WeChat, WhatsApp, Facebook and others. But everybody has on their main homepage Grab, Zalo, Facebook, YouTube, and Google. So they, they, they want it all. You know, until we see Harmony OS appear on third-party handset manufacturers, we won't know whether there will be any workarounds that are developed by then, you know, either because perhaps unlikely at this stage, but that the US-China tech rivalry dies down a little bit, or because developers and handset manufacturers find ways of still allowing you to download the banned apps, which is actually happening already uh, in the context of Huawei handsets. There are workarounds for getting Google and Facebook that are not ideal, but it is possible. Uh, So to a certain extent, this is all hypothetical, but these are obviously big stakes debates because uh, it's not just about the bottom line of the software developers themselves, namely Harmony and Android, but it's also about the broader political interests that they represent and respond to. And I I don't want to make this sound like there is this permanent um, tussle between uh, East versus West on tech. There are just so many examples where you see them cooperating despite the heated rivalries between Washington and Beijing, for example, Facebook and China Mobile International are currently building the two Africa cable down the west coast of Africa. Nobody cares, for example, that a Nigerian university student will be Googling the answer to a maths problem on an MTN operator that uses Huawei hardware in the base stations on a techno phone, for example. You know, that that is a a synthesis of tech from around the world. And none of those tech companies are concerned about the use of their uh, partners or collaborators or, or competitors' technology because 
that is the world that we live in now, that you, know, you need all of these parts. What I find interesting about this scenario is that here we're really talking about the biggest uh, tech firms. We're talking about you know, Google and we're talking about Huawei, these national champions, basically. And this is a scenario in which their interests are potentially at odds with one another. And so I'm curious to see how it plays out, but I, I would be lying if I said that I had anything more concrete <laughs> Uh, than, than, what I, um, than what I'm thinking through now. During the Trump administration, there was something called the Clean Network. Now, this was this initiative that the administration had, which was to go around the world, try and convince countries to abandon their Huawei and ZTE use, and then use equipment from Samsung, Nokia, Ericsson, and so-called friendly countries. It was an abject, miserable failure. Uh, certainly in Africa, they were 0 for 55 for the most part. In fact, they had a brief win with Iswatini, and then it would switched over like 24 hours later. So it's like take it away from them at the last minute. In my conversations with folks in the U.S. government, they say, yeah, clean network, that's uh, something that we don't do anymore. That's a Trump thing. We're the Biden administration. What's your reading today in Washington on Huawei in general and whether or not there is the drive to confront Huawei the same way there was under the Trump administration? Well, given the lockdown uh, of COVID, I'm afraid my networking is as uh, good as anyone else's, which is that it's largely confined to my apartment and my plants. So the read that I have... What are your plants telling you right now, I guess is the question. (laughs) Well, my plants telling me... Uh, what I read in the newsletters and bulletins and whatnot of, of, uh, from around D.C. And there is certainly uh, what I can sense is, you know, a, a, a desire to keep up the competition with Huawei for the foreseeable future. My read is, as someone who, who works on this topic, I don't have any insider information here, but it doesn't look like there will be any significant changes over the pressure that uh, this government will put on Huawei. Just a super, super basic question, but has there been any kind of objectively verified indications that Huawei networks are actually more vulnerable to to kind of, you know, kind of backdoors and spying and so on than other networks. You know, has that been conclusively proven or or, uh, or has, has the U.S. government mostly been, been, been kind of operating under, you know, kind of under the assumption that it is? My understanding is that it's, it's more a concern of the unknowns. So it's a concern about the possibility that you might be able to track who called who for how long. But it's also the concern about the unknown of 5G. It does have the potential to be a significant technological change uh, if it is going to be controlling driverless cars and other advanced technology systems in the future. But, you know, the, the possibility to shut down, create havoc, basically, is accentuated when you increase the use of this wireless technology. And and then, of course, that then comes back to the path dependencies of the technology you install now, having, or rather, making it more likely that you will then install 5G. But all all of this comes back to the point that these are concerns. These are not given facts yet at this stage that I'm aware of anyway. You know, I, I, I only have access to, to what's publicly available. The closest that we got to any insight to this question that you're raising was the report published by the UK's General Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, which is like the UK's version of uh, the NSA. Uh, and they did a study on Huawei's equipment for UK networks, I think it was two years ago. And the report that they published effectively concluded that There were security concerns about Huawei's equipment, but it wasn't necessarily because they were purposely built with the back doors, although certainly I'm sure that's a possibility, as any equipment could be built with back doors, but rather the conclusion that they focused on was that Huawei's equipment was greater security concern than Ericsson or Nokia because it was actually reliant on an older generation of security checks and balances. And so effectively, they were saying that the security software and the security hardware has evolved over the last few years. And Huawei, when they were writing this report, was, you know, let's say, using security mechanisms that were good in 2000 or 2005, whereas Ericsson and Nokia were using security mechanisms that are good today. And so really, it was, a, it, it was an unintentional security flaw in Huawei's equipment that was the bigger concern for them. And that's, as far as I'm aware, that is the 
most significant publicly available uh, assessment of the security concerns about Huawei's equipment versus other other competitors. The article is Huawei is trying to avoid U.S. sanctions. That may change the U.S.-China tech rivalry in Africa. It was published in the Washington Post back in April. We just had a chance today to talk with Henry Tugendat, who is a senior policy analyst with the China team at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington. He focuses a lot on tech and Chinese engagement in Africa and Latin America. Henry, thank you so much for taking the time. Your article succeeded in raising those pertinent questions and a lot of those hypotheticals so that we can have these kinds of discussions. Uh, If people want to follow what you're reading and writing and some of the research you're doing, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Hentug, H-E-N-T-U-G. Wonderful. We'll put a link to that and also the article in the show notes. Henry, once again, thank you for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric and Cobus. Cobus, we've been writing a lot about Huawei in our newsletter and on our website over the past few weeks, not only been what's going on in Ethiopia, but also digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, and then the 5G question, Harmony OS, all of these topics we've been talking about. And I think one of the takeaways that I have after listening to Henry and writing about this so much over the past few weeks is the fact that Huawei's presence in Africa is so much bigger and more varied than the 5G issues that occupy so much of the attention in places like Washington. Clearly, 5G is very important, but the issues of mobile money, cloud computing, the hardware, all of the other aspects that Huawei is involved in in Africa is to me, it's such a bigger issue and a bigger challenge that the Americans don't have an answer for. So when that conversation go on and says, we don't want you to use Huawei because we think it's dangerous, it comes back to the point that you continually raise. What is the alternative? And there really isn't an alternative for most African countries and most African telecom operators. As you've pointed out on so many occasions, it's either Huawei or nothing. It's not Huawei or Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, any of those options. Certainly not Cisco, given the fact that the American products tend to be more expensive and limited in terms of their range of offerings. So this in many ways is an academic conversation because the other players simply aren't in the market competing in the same space at the same price point. Yeah, if, if, if there were a, a, you know, a, a comprehensive kind of campaign from these these kind of non-Chinese competitors to, to be like, we're muscling in on the African market, we, we're beefing up our presence, we're offering things at, at price points that they that they can afford, then that would have been a different conversation, right? Kind of, but the fact that that's not happening means that the conversation then shifts to if... You know, if and this is a big if because because it, it you know it, it depends on on you know kind of like U.S. U.S. the U.S. tech sector kind of falling in line behind a, a kind of pressure from the U.S. administration, which we know is isn't necessarily a given. But say that there is this kind of pressure from from the U.S. to you know if, if say the pressure from the U.S. to 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 get out of the Huawei game you know, ratchets up over the next few years, then I think the the more the more likely thing is that is that Africa will just kind of be that its its marginalization will continue and that it will then be kind of like making do as it always makes do and with that it's probably then a mixture of chinese technology chinese operating systems and some kind of like workarounds to kind of get other apps in the way that that that, that they would like to you know kind of so so then it becomes a situation where africa becomes the center for for or like a, a kind of part of of the chinese standards ecosystem you know, um, which you know, I think could be the the kind of the the the, the it, it could be a result that the Americans. I, I think it would be a result that the Americans won't want, but I think it might end up being the result of of pressure. And the other part of the equation that we didn't talk about is connectivity, and there is the Pakistan East Africa Connecting Europe cable, otherwise known as the Peace Cable. I love that acronym. I think it's just great. That is a giant, uh, big trunk line that's coming into Djibouti, also Mombasa, South Africa, and then it's connecting into Marseille as well in France, coming all the way from Asia. That's going to expand considerable amounts of broadband bandwidth into most of East and Southern Africa. That has a Huawei component as well. The Chinese tech is also in data and cloud centers, not just Huawei, but China Telecom, China Unicom are big in this space. And this is all part of the digital silk road that we've been hearing so much about. I'd like to get your take on what role you think the DSR, as it's known, will play at the upcoming FOCAC summit that's going to take place sometime later this year. 
I think a big one. I think I think tech and and health are going to be some of the, like two of the big themes, particularly because the Chinese, as as we've as we've discussed with with um, Kevin Gallagher and others, you know, over the last few months, the Chinese have pulled back a lot on their on their financing for large scale kind of physical infrastructure. So so I think there's there's be, there'll be a lot of incentive for them to highlight the connectivity thing because it's also popular in Africa. So you know, kind of so 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 you know the the sting of we're not funding as many roads and bridges as we used to will be will will be will be softened by we funding all of this all of this data connectivity and i think african governments are are generally obsessed with with getting more and more connectivity in because because it also then kind of over overcomes some of the other kind of built in disadvantages um, in in the country it makes it easier it makes it easier for, for for rural populations to to be part of the economy there's a billion different incentives for african leaders to to be happy with with extra connectivity um, and it plays very well on the ground in Africa, so, so everyone's happy. So I think it'll be a big theme. One of the hazards of having a conversation like what we've just had today is that it makes it sound as if Huawei is the only Chinese player that's in the African tech ecosystem, which is, of course, not true at all. We've had a lot of activity in the past few weeks in the venture capital space. Opay, which is the Chinese back mobile money app in Nigeria, is now going back out into the capital markets, going towards China, in fact, to raise $400 million. MSA Capital, which is a Chinese venture capital firm based in Beijing, participated in two funding rounds in Egypt this past month. So there's a lot of excitement happening in the financing space as well as in the app space. When we talk about Chinese tech, we have to talk about transit, but not only in the context of hardware devices, but also in terms of services, where they own the Boomplay app, which is by far the most popular music service on the continent. Star Times, which is the Beijing-based satellite pay TV service, is one of the largest uh, operators on the continent as well. So lots of different aspects to the China-Africa tech relationship beyond Huawei. Very important for us to also keep that in mind that this is a multi-layered, multifaceted relationship. So that'll do it for this edition of the podcast. Once again, a reminder, we've talked all throughout the show of what we cover these issues in our daily newsletter and on our website every day. If you're looking for analysis, especially on Huawei and all that's going on in Ethiopia, we highly recommend that you subscribe to the China Africa Project. You can see all of our tech coverage on the website. In fact, we have a dedicated section just for Huawei alone, given that it comes up so much. Just click on the tab Huawei and you'll see everything that's come up over the years. Great for researchers like Henry, who also subscribes to the China Africa Project and uses it in his daily work. Uh, we'd love for you to check it out. You can try it for 30 days free. Just see if you like it. If you have any questions, you can also reach out to Cobus and myself. I'm at eric at chinaafricaproject.com and Cobus is C-O-B-U-S at chinaafricaproject.com. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another edition. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Yolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. Thank you.